It's fair to say that critical reception regarding Final Fantasy XV has been mixed. Opinions on its quality differ from person to person, but in general there has been a lot of criticism directed towards this game's inability to resurrect the golden age of JRPGs. And I admit, I feel like a good amount of this criticism is warranted. I personally found the game to be very flawed. I enjoyed playing through it, but I found it to be a level below the rest of the games in the series that I have played. Those being Final Fantasies 4, 6, 7, 9, and 10. To sum it up, the plot felt like an underdeveloped and incoherent mess at times, the pacing was turbulent in places, certain characters were underdeveloped, leading to a disconnect in certain emotional scenes, extremely important plot points were not properly expanded upon or simply left out, I was left scratching my head at a lot of the circumstances and unfulfilled potential behind the 10 year time skip, and the side quests were very dull for me. To me, it felt like a very rushed game that expected you to do a bunch of research beforehand to properly comprehend the story, relying on its related works as a vital part of the experience, rather than supplementary to the experience, which I found to be a negative. But I think that in being frustrated with a piece of work not meeting one's expectations, we can sometimes get carried away with focusing on the negatives. Exhibit A, my irrational knee-jerk tweet that you see here, which I definitely don't agree with in reflection. For the sake of balance, I must reiterate that I still enjoyed Final Fantasy XV. What salvaged it in some ways for me were a terrific soundtrack, some amazing visuals, a relatively fun battle system, the really powerful Greek tragedy-esque structure of the story, and most of all, the relationship between the four main characters. The dynamics between these four felt so genuine throughout the game that I couldn't help but be drawn in and invested in their journey, even if I wasn't so invested in other aspects of the story. These four brothers have such a palpable and natural bond. There were some very nice moments and story sequences that were born from the nature of their relationship and character dynamics. In reflecting on my unique experience with Final Fantasy XV, I've come to the conclusion that it definitely wasn't a bad game. It had some bad characteristics for sure, and despite some admirable ambition, it flubbed on some aspects of his execution plenty of times. But here I'd like to focus instead on a part of the story in which the execution was spot on. Let's dissect Chapter 10. For me, Chapter 10 was easily the best chapter in the entire game. It was close to a work of storytelling art, and if as much effort and craftsmanship went into the other aspects of the game, or perhaps if the production wasn't as rushed, Final Fantasy XV would have been much improved compared to the final product that we got, by my estimation. While a great deal of what makes it an effective stretch of story is centered around our four boys as I said, Square Enix also hit it out of the park here in terms of visuals, audio, tone, atmosphere, pacing, tiny little details, and most of all, the amalgamation of all of these aspects. To me, there's great value in quiet parts of a story. Almost every narrative needs some downtime, a lull in the plot, to reflect on prior events and let emotions within the characters stew. This grounds the story, and allows some thus far lesser emphasized aspects of the story to come to the foreground. I really admire these quieter story beats for what they can achieve with character development and exploration, proper pacing, and allowing prior events and the impact of louder scenes to sink in. In Final Fantasy XV's Chapter 10, all of these elements are present in spades. Lots of little touches throughout allow the characters, and by extension the audience, to feel the gravity of the situation. Chapter 9 ended on a hammer blow for our characters. The Star Scourge was gaining momentum, Darkness was beginning to take hold of the land, and most of all, Ignis had lost his vision. There was also the very obvious emotional impact that Luna Freya's death had. I thought of her as more of an abstract concept or plot device than a fleshed out character. But regardless, her death was a devastating blow for Noctis. So the train sequence that Chapter 10 begins with was essential for letting the dust settle and letting the story breathe, forcing the players and characters to reflect on the dire straits that they were in, and what this journey had cost them. Chapter 10 showed a very succinct summary of each of the four characters, their interactions at a time where they were at rock bottom being a microcosm of their characterization and the type of people they were. Prompto, as ever, was the heart of the group, trying to mediate and help everyone get along, to no avail. Gladio spent a good time of it lashing out, angry at Noctis for his behavior, but I got a very distinct impression that he blamed himself. Guilty for what happened with Luna Freya, and especially Ignis, 
Gladio had never felt this low before, and needed an outlet for his remorse and anger, revealing that the guy had much more to him than the gruff and confident exterior. Ignis had obviously been dealt a tragic blow for a man who loved seeing the world at its clearest, but as ever he was resolute in his ability to see the bigger situation. While clearly devastated, Ignis continuously provided the group with sound and logical advice. And lastly, the nature of Noctis' character was clearer than ever in Chapter 10. Here we see a young man retreat into his shell, brooding and immature, not sure what to do because he had never experienced loss like this or been exposed to this situation before. He didn't know how to react and take responsibility yet. He felt absolutely lost and it terrified him. Seeing our protagonist so helpless and lost in despair really hit hard and was powerful to me even if I hadn't been too invested in the story up until that point, simply because I was invested in these characters. This train sequence was a piece of juxtaposition-centric surrealism, used to great effect to serve its purpose. The train is traveling in broad daylight, so instead of pathetic fallacy, the bright lighting starkly contrasts the mood during this point in the story, hammering home how far from a normal life and a happy situation our heroes had come. The player is given no objective other than to aimlessly wander the train here, with no quest marker or goal in sight. We are forced to walk around this train without a purpose, in a forced pause, opposite to most of the story missions prior to this. And there was a very obvious disconnect between what the player and Noctis were experiencing and the attitudes of the people on this train. We can see that they're happy, laughing, talking, eating, going about their lives without a care. And in this moment, this attitude is foreign to Noctis, a man with the weight of the world on his shoulders. This clashing dissonance here between the deep tone of the story at this point, along with the negative states of our characters, and the mundane normality of the situation on this train, was so effective in emboldening how dark this narrative moment was. Something else of note here was that the audio design was spot on. The music was minimalistic and offbeat, with no real pattern of note, allowing it to augment the contemplative nature of Chapter 10 as well. The voice acting was absolutely terrific here, with the actors talking in a more understated, somber, and in some cases, more rage-induced tone than we had ever heard from them before, but without this changed feeling forced. I also noticed that in a lot of cases, you couldn't hear dialogue from NPCs on the train. It felt to me as if Noctis was almost shutting it out, singularly focusing on the agony that he had been trying so hard to avoid before. But when you do hear dialogue here, it was to ironically contrast his emotional burden with a throwaway, light-hearted comment about food, or to communicate news of the aftermath of the tragedy of Altitia to keep the story flowing outside this personal episode. These were all subtle little audio touches that weren't extremely noticeable in the moment, but they do their job in not being noticeable, and bringing the feelings of the characters to the forefront of the chapter. Eventually, we move outside of the train to easily the saddest stretch of story in the game, in my opinion. As the guys continue their quest in collecting the royal arms, they make their way to a marshy stretch of forest. And then, assuming that the player decides to take Ignis on the mission with them, the story strikes us with the most tragic sight of the game for me. Ignis slowly, blindly trying to keep up with the group, clutching his cane. Here, Gladio yells your ear off if you decide to run too far ahead of the group, but the beauty of this scene here is that completely ignoring Gladio, I never wanted to stray too far from Ignis. Without any reinforcement, I, along with many others I know who play this game, never intended to leave Ignis too far behind because I was invested in the man enough such that his emotional and physical well-being was paramount. I didn't even care about fetching the royal arm, to be honest. And this is exactly how this part of the game should have been. Now, this wasn't perfect execution, and I had times where Ignis became bugged or stuck on a rock, or where Gladio yelled at me even though I was right next to Ignis, but these minor technical flaws were nearly unnoticeable when compared to the great emotion of the sequence. When we move into the battles, it becomes painfully clearer than ever that Ignis had become a burden, and the integration of story into gameplay here was stellar. Ignis literally could not attack. The player is unable to control his actions as he blindly fumbles around, trying desperately to help. This makes the battles in this area quite a bit more difficult, less cohesive, and less of a team effort, throwing off the chemistry. The group was reduced to three earlier in the game when Gladio went out on his little detour, but the emotional context then was much more cheerful than it was now, making it seem a lot more effortless. 
This all reflects the fact that these four brothers are less of a team now than they had ever been, and the new difficulty of the battles due to this was very telling from a narrative perspective as well as a gameplay one. And it all comes together in a heartbreaking moment where we hear such a formerly confident and exuberant man asking if he was a burden. Because the truth is, he was. Hey, you should hang back. Was I in the way? No, you weren't. It's just... <sighs> the absence of Ignis in battle left a bigger void than you'd think it should have, and this was a brilliant little nod to the fact that this blow was monumentally painful for the group as a whole. Without Ignis in his highest spirits, everything felt disconnected, dark, and wrong, and the group found it much harder to accomplish their goals. It's a very delicate situation that the heroes are thrown into here. In a situation like this, you want to help your friend as much as possible, but you don't want to make them feel like they need too much help. And of course the person in question will likely try their best to function normally and not be a burden, but sometimes needs must. A balance here can be very hard or nearly impossible to find in this situation, and Final Fantasy XV pulled off the emotional weight exceptionally well here. Lastly, there is an optional campsite to use here, where some very powerful story beats occur. Obviously, Ignis is unable to cook like usual in this state, so the group can't really eat anything proper. And again, we're given a snapshot of characterization here. Prompto can't sit as he helps Ignis to his seat and desperately looks around in vain for something positive to latch onto. I felt a ton of sympathy for him as he proceeds to his usual routine of showing off some pictures he took, but quickly realizes that this is not the time. Ignis and Noct are deadly quiet, each for his own reasons, and Gladio separates himself and in some cases faces away from the group, likely unable to face them because of how he blames himself. It's another depressing yet well done scene that contributes even more to the bleak atmosphere. Luckily, this chapter doesn't wallow too much in its grief, as things begin to look up near the end when, after fighting a boss, Ignis implores the group, mainly Noctis and Gladio, to stick together for his sake. And the group are smart enough to reconcile, but a lovely little touch was that the two weren't buddy-buddy with each other right away. They had accepted that their negative dynamics were detrimental, but the feelings were still very ripe, and you don't just completely make up without a problem from a situation like this. It was a very realistic touch. A proper and gradual makeup would come with time, but now wasn't the time for drama. I was looking forward to seeing how Noct and Gladio would be able to work this one out in the future, and was disappointed in seeing that the game doesn't really touch on this after Ignis's speech, as the two seem to be able to suddenly be all good with each other. But I digress. My point is, the positives vastly outweigh the negatives here. Final Fantasy XV's Chapter 10 was a raw, brilliant piece of work that communicates and demonstrates how much you can lose by staking your life on such a difficult task as Noctis is. It made you reflect and feel the weight of the sadness that had happened previously, and it puts the boys in a very difficult situation, which makes it all the more gratifying when they overcome these trials. This stretch of story, especially the train sequence, was lyrical, poetic, and almost artistic in its resonance. A ton of care went into this chapter, and the reason that Final Fantasy XV will end up being a memorable game for me, despite being very flawed, was mainly because of the highs of chapter 10. It's just too bad that the rest of the game doesn't live up to this level of quality for me, but I guess that's what the up-and-coming DLC is for. But despite how I'm making it sound like Chapter 10 was the only positive thing about the game for me, I do think that there was more good in Final Fantasy XV apart from this chapter and what I've mentioned. I particularly found the tragedy aspect of the story to be very powerful. We were left with an impression at the end that a lot of this conflict was meaningless. So much is sacrifice and our characters go through hell, to simply make it so that this world is somewhat livable. There was no real evil in the world, arguably apart from the actions of Ifrit, and if you don't know what I'm talking about, don't worry, the game failed to explain this properly. Arden did some evil things, but he was dealt a horrifyingly unfair hand, and a lot of the conflict was just a big shame that things had to go this way. I felt like this was an exceptionally powerful approach, and an effective somber and dark tone in many of the scenes accentuated this. So while I do think that a lot of this game was unfulfilled potential, I was still impressed by a number of things we got at release. Anyway, let me know what you thought about not only this chapter, but the game in general, if you're so inclined. I always find it fascinating to hear opinions on this one, since they tend to differ so greatly from person to person. 
Where does this game rank for you in the series? Does it put the series back on track? Was the series ever off track for you? Let me know in the comments, and thanks again as always for watching.